Okay, time to do an expository study of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, we're going to begin here in verse 1. If you want to turn in your Bible there. It says here, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, as I said back in the first uh, the study last week of chapter 1, your strength needs to come from the Lord Jesus Christ, from the Holy Ghost. Okay, your strength doesn't come from yourself. It doesn't come from your uh, friends, your family, your organizations, or whatever else. It comes from the Lord. That's where your strength needs to come from. Verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is a very, very important scripture here. If you're a preacher, if you're in any kind of a uh, work like that, your job is threefold, okay? The job of a preacher. Number one, you have to learn the Bible from many witnesses. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. All right? Don't learn from just one man. Don't have your preacher up on a pulpit, up in the pulpit there. Don't put him up on a pedestal and say, my preacher, brother so-and-so, doctor so-and-so, can't do anything wrong. Bad idea. You should learn from multiple witnesses. That's very important. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 says, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Now, that standard there of two or three witnesses in the Bible is talking mostly about um, the standard of, you know, judging things. If you don't have, if it's, if it's this guy's word against that guy, well, that's, not really that good of a, a an issue there, a good a good of a thing. You need to have two or three witnesses. You have two or three or more people come along and say, yeah, we saw so-and-so do this. Now you got something. And if you take that thing to court, to a just court of law, and you say, uh, you know, I want to witness against so-and-so that they did this. They'll say, well, are you the only one that saw it? Yeah. You know, well, not a very strong case. But now if you can have two or three witnesses with you and all your stories corroborate, you know, they all come together, you're all saying the same thing and you don't know each other, now you got a good case. And in like manner, when you're learning the Bible and you learn, you see, you read something from the Bible and you go, hmm, it almost looks like it teaches this. And you go and you read a commentary or you listen to a preacher or you know a preacher and you, you call them and you talk to them and you know, you say, hey, what about this? Does this verse mean that? Am I right in that? And the one guy says, yeah, that's exactly it. That's, you got that verse right. And you look at your commentary and you oh, he says it's right too. And you look at somebody else, see, that's a good standard to have, two or three witnesses when it comes to interpreting scripture. And interestingly too, up until recently, I always believed in a one-man pastor. But if you even look at that one verse there, you know, there should be many witnesses. So if you have multiple elders within a local body of believers, you know, and those multiple elders, none of them is going to be able to lord over the flock because there's other guys there that, you know, are also in charge of the place there. They're also overseeing the flock. So you have those multiple elders and two or three of those guys can witness of whatever the Bible is teaching. And, you, you know, you're going to have times where, you know, some of the elders might not agree. Some of them might say, well, I don't really agree with them on this or on that or whatever. Well, okay, then you look for a witness someplace else. All right? So that's very important there. The second thing, first you have that you need to learn from multiple witnesses if you're a preacher. Second, you have to commit what you have learned to faithful men. Don't try to lord over them, in other words. Don't try to, to, you know, do your little agenda or something like that and just lord over people and keep people down and say, I remember I was going to this one phallus house one time, the pastor there, somebody asked a question. They said, how do we know that the Bible is really, truly God's word? And he said, that's a very good question and also very difficult. Sometime we'll have to cover that. And I thought to myself, you can't answer that question. You can't tell me, you, you can't tell some person out there how you can know for sure that the Bible is God's Word? I can answer that thing in no time at all. Prophecy. We've been given a more sure word of prophecy. 
if this book was written by men, it wouldn't be able to tell you what is happening in the future. The way you can know is not just historical proof of the King James, which is there, and manuscript evidence and all the other stuff, but the real test is a supernatural book will be able to tell the future. And the King James does. You know, written back in 1611, and yet the King James is the only Bible that says the mark of the beast is going to be in the right hand or in the forehead. And for years and years and years, people said, oh, I don't know about that. How could that be possible? Before we had implantable microchips. Now we have implant implantable microchips and everybody goes, oh, maybe the King James was right. Yeah, you know, a Bible that's over 400 years old, and yet it gets that Bible prophecy correct. That's how you know it's from God. So, but you know, you get a lot of these preachers, these hirelings, and they learn early on that if they give the people too much, then the people might not need them. Might not require their services, you know. So, you know, you kind of keep the people down. You know, you kind of keep them like that. You don't commit things to faithful men who can teach others also. Uh-uh. You say you have to come here to be taught the Word of God. That's a problem. Number three... Oh, let me read the verses here. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth, not away. There's a description of the elders in a local assembly. There should be multiple elders and they should take the oversight and they should feed the flock of God. You see, if you have a system where one man is ruling things and running the show and he's not giving out the truth, all aspects of the truth, to those men that are coming in there, well, what's it take? All Satan has to do is take out the preacher the one-man preacher, and the whole place folds. And how many times does that happen? They get these giant big phallus houses, and they got the man of God up there, you know, and he's up there preaching the word, and, and he's doing a wonderful job, and the Bible says, and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, that preacher, that man of God, has some kind of a problem, has some kind of a sin, and he steps down, or is forced to step down, and the whole congregation just goes, and just scatters. Why? Well, because he was lording over the people. And so the wolf came, and, well, many times the preacher himself is a wolf, but, you know, there's a problem there, and the sheep are scattered. See, my job is to give you as much scripture as I can get into you. You know why? So that you don't need me eventually. That's my job. If you never outgrow me, then I'm not doing a good job. You need to be able to be understanding the Bible so that if my channel ever gets shut down on YouTube, you aren't going to be going, what am I going to do now? What do I believe? Who am I going to turn to? You need to study these things so that you can in turn go out and do ministry. You don't say, hey, you know, uh, let, me, let me witness to you by you know, giving you all of Brian Dellinger's sermons. You know, I mean, some of that stuff is okay. You know, give my sermons, share my sermons, that's fine. But what I'm saying is, you got to get to a point where you're able to preach the word on your own. You know, and then find other faithful men and commit the truth to them. That's important. Number three, third job of a, of a God-called preacher is encourage the faithful men to go out and teach and preach what you have taught them. Acts chapter 12, verses 20 through 25 says, And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod arrayed, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god, and not of a man. A lot of, like a lot of people do with Obama. He needs to be careful. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms, and gave up the ghost. Look at this, verse 24. 
But the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Well, you know, they should have really just, I mean, the 12 apostles, you know, Paul being the replacement for, the, for Judas Iscariot, those 12 apostles, brother, they should, have just, they should have just said, hey, you don't listen to any other preacher but us. All right? If you're not listening to the preaching of Paul, you're of the devil or something. No. What did they do? Hey, Barnabas, come here. John, Mark, hey, hey, you want to preach? Are you faithful? Hey, do you want to preach? Are you faithful? Here's the word. What, can, what, what uh, questions do you have that I can answer? Study the word of God so that you can go out and preach to other people. You know, YouTube is a great resource. And, and, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people that tune in here and that watch these sermons, and I thank the Lord for that. But there's a lot of people that don't have high-speed Internet. There's a lot of people out there that don't want high-speed Internet. You know, <laughs> I kind of am that way myself sometimes. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of people out there. They need good Bible-believing preachers. Something to think about. And if you've been listening to these studies and you, you know, have a, your Bible and you have your notes all written out and you, you're really learning a lot from, from this ministry, well, praise the Lord for that. But let me tell you something. Let me encourage you. If you're learning a lot and you're feeling, feeling that passion building within you, that desire to get out there and get the Word to people, and you get around other people and you see how, I mean, excuse me here, but how dumb the average Christian is. And I say that because I used to be one of them. Okay, uh, there's a dearth of, of wisdom, of biblical preaching. That's why I do this ministry. But if you're seeing that, and you feel the Lord calling you to go and take the truth to the people out there, let me just encourage you to do that. All right? I have no desire to monopolize the market, so to speak. <laughs> I don't have any desire to just have everybody to myself and don't ever go to anybody else and stuff like that a lot of reasons a lot of the reason why I don't recommend a lot of other channels on YouTube is simply because I can't put in the time to go and listen to all their videos you know I used to endorse a lot of people and then they turn out to say some pretty heretical things and it, uh, you know so my point is study the Word of God so that you can go out and teach other men and then encourage them to go out and teach other men and then they'll go out and teach other men. And then they'll go out and teach other men. See, it spreads out. That's the way it should be. Continuing here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. These are my two favorite verses in the entire Bible. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You say, why is that your favorite, you know, two favorite verses? Well, because when you go into ministry, if you look at the thing as being a soldier going off to war, you'll do pretty good. You say, why is that? Well, a soldier must do seven things. And you could add a whole lot of other things to this list, but I just condensed it down to seven things. Number one, a soldier must take orders from his commanding officer. Do you take orders from Jesus Christ? Hmm. You know, there's a thing in the military, they say, there's only three answers that you can give. Yes, sir. No, sir. No excuse, sir. Is that your relationship with Jesus Christ? You say, what about you, Brian? What about you? Uh, no, I fail at that a lot. There's been many a time when the Lord has given me a command, and I don't give one of those answers. And I eventually have to come back with the no, no excuse, sir. I messed up. The best thing that you can do as a Christian is get to the point where you say, yes, sir. Hey, go on over there. Put a tract over there. Yes, sir. Not, uh, uh, I, I, I got to get to work right now. Um, besides, that guy's looking at me. I, you know, uh-uh. Yes, sir. It's important. Number two is a thing a soldier should do. Number two, go through basic training before entering combat. 
you run off into combat before you have your basic training, before you really know what this Bible's all about. You know, you're a novice, as it says there. You know, First Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, I think it is. Or is it uh, 2, verse 6? Sorry, my mind's a little clouded right now. Um, but the whole thing is chapter 3, verse 6. Yeah, okay. That's what I thought it was at first there. But uh, the whole thing is if you're a novice, you're not ready for combat yet. Spend a little bit of time studying the Word. You go into combat too quickly, you're going to get taken out by the enemy. Number three, another thing a soldier must do, you must anticipate trouble. You don't go out and say, oh, this is so wonderful. I'm so happy to be here on the battlefield. You know, here's the, here's the uh, edge of the foxhole. I'm just going to stand up like this and look around. You know, there's machine guns over here on this other side of the ridge over there. But I'm just going to look over and see if I can see them. Wave to them. Hey, you know, you don't do that. Don't get out there into the world and think, I'm just going to, I think maybe I'll get along with the lost. You know, I'm just going to, hey, lost people, you know, <laughs> they're going to get you. And don't think that you can make fun of Satan or, you know, oh, I, I'm not going to be affected by Satan. <laughs> I, yes, you will. Satan is a very, very dangerous foe. Most powerful being in the universe outside of the Godhead. Remember that. And he doesn't like you. And he's got a whole lot of servants that don't like you either. Number four, this kind of ties in, be vigilant. You know, if I was in a battle situation right now, right over there, there could, there could be an enemy soldier laying right in those weeds over there with his sights right, on, right about here on the side of my head. You know? As a soldier, you've got to be vigilant. You're walking through an area like this, you've got to be very, very careful and very looking and stuff like that. You know, you get online, you get online, it's like walking through a minefield. You gotta be vigilant. I mean, you do do a, a simple search on Google sometimes, you'd be shocked the stuff that comes up. You're not even looking for it, you know? What's going on? The enemy is attacking on all fronts. Be vigilant. Another thing a soldier has to do is get the very best weapon and keep it clean. You say, uh, boy, I got this, I have this Cambridge Bible right here, buddy. This thing cost me $110. And it did, by the way, I'm not making that up. And I got this expensive Cambridge Bible. Man, it's a, it's a good one. I got it, it's a good one. Uh, well, could you give me a verse on um, drunkenness? Uh, boy, I have, I have no idea. Um, there's probably something in here, but I'm not sure. How about something else? Okay, could you give me a, a verse on idolatry? Could you turn to where the Ten Commandments are? Could you give me a verse on fornication? Could you give me a verse on this? Could you give me a... Uh, it's be kind of like carrying a, a nice fully automatic M16 or an M60. We'll really go big. M60. And you're walking along with the M60 and, oh, here comes the enemy. You go, what do I do? Well, you got a gun right there in your hand. Shoot him. I don't know how to use it. Or, you know, worse yet, you go to shoot it. What's going on? Well, I don't know. Well, is your gun clean? No, I haven't cleaned it in probably a month. You know, <laughs> it's a problem. Kind of like a Christian that comes along and doesn't read their Bible. Doesn't keep this thing sharp. They don't hide God's word in their heart. They spend all their time with entertainment. Careful about that. Number six thing that a soldier needs to do is a soldier needs to fight. I've talked about that thing before. If you're not fighting out there in the world, if you're not fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil, you're going to fight other brethren. It's, you are called to fight as a soldier. You're going to fight the enemy or you're going to fight each other. Simple. Number seven a soldier is called oftentimes to die on the battlefield. Would you die for Jesus Christ? Things are going to get real bad here in the future, and I've been saying this for a long time, and you can see it, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And at some point in time, if the Lord doesn't take us out of here soon, it's going to get to a point where Christians are going to start being executed. 
it happened for all of church history. I mean, study church history. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs sometime. You know, it's we have been in a very blessed time period, I guess you could say, where we haven't been hunted down like animals and killed for a while. But that time is going to come to an end. And at that point in time, you're going to have to ask yourself, are you willing to die on the battlefield for Jesus Christ? And you say, yeah, I'll die for Jesus Christ. Okay, here's an even tougher one. Would you die a slow death for Jesus Christ? Ooh. <laughs> That's rough, isn't it? It certainly is. And, uh, you know, we should all have some pause for concern when we see our own government, you know, torturing people, you know, in these, in these camps and stuff, you know, the Guantanamo Bay and all this stuff like that, you know, and a lot of people go, well, they're just terrorists. Uh, well, you better look at some of the uh, Homeland Security designations for what makes up a domestic terrorist. A lot of Christians qualify. They're torturing people from Al-Qaeda, you know, whatever that is, Al-Qaeda, you know. If they're torturing people from that, it's only a step or two before they're torturing Christians. But uh, Ephesians chapter 6, you can turn there in your Bible. You're going to see the, this is probably one of the greatest places in the Bible on the subject of soldiers. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, read down through verse 20. Okay, it says here, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. You saw last week's study on uh, chapter 1 there. This thing about standing, holding fast the form of sound words. Verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, King James Bible, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am, also, or for which I am an ambassador... In bonds, that there I, therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Do you have to be bold to be a soldier? Well, you should be. You know, I, I can't say that uh, some of these, this modern military, you know, now with a whole bunch of sodomites and people practicing in bestiality and whatever else. And, you know, that was that one legislation thing. I'm not making that up. They actually legalized bestiality in the military. But, uh, you know, you get these effeminate, you know, sodomites running around. I don't, can't imagine they'd be very bold in battle. But, uh, you know, a soldier, a real one, should be bold. And when you look at your Christian service, your ministry, with that battle type of aspect, you know, where you're looking at it and you're realizing you're being shot at, that's the way it's supposed to be. And you shoot back, you know. And... You go out there, and I'm talking spiritually here. Don't get excited, people. You know, cut this out and try to say I'm calling for violence or something. No, I'm not calling for violence. What I'm calling for is for Christians to start to realize that we are at war with this lost world. And the enemy is pretty much encircled us right now. And they're closing in, breaking through the defenses. Those defenses that are Christian forefathers in this nation of America set up, the enemy's breaking them down one by one. And uh, at some point in time, you know, they're going to be in range. You know, there's an old saying in the military that uh, if the enemy is, if, if the enemy is within range, so are you. <laughs> you know, a lot of truth to that. Uh, there's a, there's kind of a neat thing there too. I mean, we, we can see 
you know, the, the battle lines are really being drawn right now. I mean, you can really see saved versus lost, but that's a problem the other way, too, because they can see who's really saved, too. And they can start saying, you know, a lot of the lost people are looking at the modern Christians and just go, they're not a danger to us at all. But that King James Bible believer is survivalist. You know, whatever they want to call us. <laughs> you know, they, they're going to be a problem in the future. At some point in time, I want to do a study on some of the big dangers that are facing Bible-believing Christians right now. But you are called to be a soldier. And you are to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It will be tough as a Christian. A lot of the, one of the ways that you can tell a false convert many times is because they're very thin-skinned. They can't take much reproof, much rebuke. And you kick them a little bit and they'll just fall to pieces. Uh, you shouldn't be that way as a Christian. You should have, uh, you know, pretty thick skin. So anyways, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2 if you're not there already. It says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. If you want to read about the crowns there, you can go back to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'll just read verse 4 here again. It says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now, you're not going to be crowned. You're not going to get that crown of glory there. Um, yeah, the crown of glory, you're not going to get that unless you strive lawfully. If you come in and you say, you know, you get to the judgment seat of Christ and you say, I, I built this great work for the Lord and, and well, how'd you do it? Well, I used the world's techniques. Well, then you didn't strive lawfully. See, you were a showman and you were through your charismatic speeches and your orations that you did, kind of like Herod, you know, you drew in all these people. That's not striving for the Lord lawfully. That's striving awfully, not lawfully. But uh, you're not going to get crowned. Wouldn't it be a tragedy to get to stand before the Lord and to realize that all your ministry that you had was all in vain? It was all for your own glory? Better think about that if you're wanting to serve the Lord. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Okay, now, you can, you know, I don't think that that means that, you know, I mean, there is a thing about a, a preacher, you know, being a partaker of the fruit of the flock. I understand that. The thing of, you know, reaping carnal things and that people send donations. That's there. But I don't think that's what's being talked about in this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you can turn there in your Bible. I think this is something else that's being spoken of here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. It says here, For though I be free from all men, yet have, have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Un, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. Okay, he's talking, in other words, about, you know, without law, there are people that are, you know, Gentiles. Uh, continuing here, it says, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Now, the thing there about the husband that, husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. I think it's what's really going on there is the Lord saying, if you're going to stand up and preach to people and tell people how they can get out of problems and, and how they can uh, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might and things like that, if you're going to do that, uh, you're going to have to go through some things first. You're going to have to go through a lot of those same things. Um, right now, I have a very very bad headache and I struggle with the headaches all the time and and uh, you know I know that there are saints out there that go through a lot more pain than I do but um, I'm I'm not uh, a stranger to sickness and you know so I get somebody that comes along and says boy I'm really sick a lot I can relate I'm not gonna look at them and say 
well, you're sick because you're you're wicked or something like that. You know, no, I understand. You know, and uh, I've had money problems. I can relate to people that have money problems. I've had uh, people attack me, um, and I've I've had a lot of issues. Why? Because the Lord says, "Hey, you want to be a, a husbandman, there, Brian? You want to be a preacher that I'm going to use? Okay, I'm going to put you through some things." And you know, oftentimes God will use somebody who has a past of of sin and, and hardship because he knows that he can rely on those types of people more. You know, there's a lot of things I did in the world before I got saved. I'm not going to be going back to that. You know, and there's a, it's good to get saved early on in life, you know, and, and get sanctified and cleaned up. But oftentimes a lot of people like that will have that carnal curiosity there. Well, I wonder what the world's like about this or that. And they'll always kind of be double-minded. But you get somebody who's been through some things and that has known what it's like to go and, you know, have some rough times. They're not going to be anxious to go back to it. And they're going to be able to tell people uh, by experience, hey, let me tell you something. I used to be like that. You don't want to do that. So I think that's what's going on there. You know, but uh, going back here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, we'll go to the next verse. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Okay. There again, now I'll just use that for this ministry. Hey, everybody out there, consider what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding in all things. The Lord give thee understanding in all things. In other words, what I say has to be filtered through the Bible. And if I say something contrary to Scripture, then you mark it down. I don't know what I'm talking about. All right? Consider what I say. It doesn't say, believe every word I say. Consider it. And the Lord will show you one way or the other. Hey, yeah, he's right. Hey, no, actually, Brian's wrong on that. 2 Timothy 2, 8 and 9. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Now, he says there he suffers trouble. Who was persecuting Paul the most? Of all the people back then, who, was, who were the ones that were really persecuting Paul? The Jews. You can turn your Bible to Acts chapter 13. I'm going to show you here a, the mark of true Christian love and charity. You know, I'm going to show you how Paul was persecuted by these people, and yet he loved them in spite of that. Just amazing. Acts chapter 13, verse 44 through 52. We'll read this quick here. It says, And the next Sabbath day came the, almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. I love that. And spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should have should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord were, was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Okay. So then you see there Paul saying in verse 46 about that, uh, you know, they're going to go, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So... That was the last time that Paul ever preached to the Jews. Because after all, they persecuted him. And so he just said, fine. Hey, you want to be that way? I'm not ever going to preach to you people again. I'm one of the Gentiles and I'll never speak to another Jew as long as I live. Is that what he said? Go to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, verse 5. Okay, it says here, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. 
And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. <laughs> well, wait a second, Paul. You said that before. What are you doing witnessing to the Jews again? Well, then this time, certainly this time for sure, Paul was done with the Jews and he never preached to them again. Because after all, the body of Christ now is the, really, truly the Jewish nation. And so, you know, we don't deal with Jewish Jews in the flesh. And, uh -huh. Turn to Acts chapter 28. You know, Paul was a Jew. He had a very special burden for his own people. We'll see that as we continue here. Acts chapter 28, verse 23. Okay, and it says here, And when they had appointed him a day, this is after his trial, you know, when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed, after that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among, turn the page here, among themselves. Verse 30, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Interesting. So Paul, three different times, said, I am done with you Jews. You guys aren't even listening. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. Just forget you people. Your blood's on you. Hey man, I'm sorry. A little while later, he sees a bunch of Jews. I'd like to talk to you about Jesus Christ. They oppose themselves and blaspheme. And, uh, all right, fine, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. A little while later, hey, there's some Jews over there. I think I'd like to go witness to them. <laughs> so why did Paul continue to preach to these Jews even though they kept rejecting Jesus Christ? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Huh. Now this is in one of my or, uh, post trib moment exposed videos. The little false prophet Stephen Anderson is going around saying that every reference to the elect in your Bible, it's always a reference to saved people. Right there is one that it's not. It's talking about lost Jews. That's why Paul kept coming to them and preaching to them. He was enduring all things for their sake. They are the elect, the chosen people of God. So you see, he couldn't keep himself, he couldn't stop himself from preaching to these people, even though they didn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. Turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 9. This is very interesting. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. This, this will show you what true Christian charity and love is all about. Romans 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants, and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Would you be willing to go to hell to see people get saved? That's rough. But Paul was actually, he's saying, you know, at there, there at the beginning, he's saying, I'm saying the truth in Christ. I lie not. I'm, I'm not fooling around here. And he was saying, I'd be willing to go 
be accursed from Christ. If you're accursed from Christ, where do you go? You go to hell. Paul was saying he would have been willing to go to hell if it meant the salvation of his nation of Israel. That nation of Israel that Paul was a part of. That's true love. When you keep, you see these people, these very, very special people, the, na the nation of Israel, and you see them, there should be a love in your heart for those people. And if you get a chance to witness to them, you should take that opportunity. Above all people out there, you should take the opportunity to witness to a Jew. And uh, if you've seen the pre-trib rapture moment there, number 17, where I talk about Stephen Anderson, I question his salvation because he, of his hatred for the Jewish people. It's unnatural for a professing Christian to hate the Jewish people. You have Paul saying that he would be willing to go to hell and burn forever if it meant the salvation of the Jews. But then you have somebody who says that they're saved and they hate the Jews? I don't think so. Continuing here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Okay, turning your Bible to John chapter 15. What you have here in these three verses, 2 Timothy 2 verses 11 through 13, you have here the formula for your millennial inheritance. How do you get inheritance in the millennial kingdom? If you want to reign with Jesus Christ, there are certain things that you're going to have to do. And they're listed right there in those three verses. You need to suffer with him. John chapter 15 verse 14 says, Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. How do we have those things made known unto us that, uh, that the Lord wants for us in our lives? Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Hmm. Yet people try to take the Bible away from you. They're not the friends of the Lord. He wants to make his word known to you. Okay, verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Question. Are you living a life that resembles Paul, his life? Are you living a life that resembles Jesus Christ? Or are you loved by the world? Does the world respect you? Does the world love you? That's a problem. It's a big problem. If you're a real servant of Jesus Christ, if you're really truly doing His will in your life, you're not going to get along too good with the world. That doesn't mean you have to go out of your way to be a jerk to people and to have people hate you. You don't have to do that. But uh, you just living as a Christian is going to upset people. I was on a forum here the other day. I was doing some research and I saw this forum and this, they were talking about a chick track. And uh, they actually the one guy had seen a bumper sticker that said, if you can earn it, why did he die? Why did he die, you know? And he was saying, what does that mean? And they were like, oh, that's a fundamentalist Christian thing that they say that, you know, you can't earn salvation. It's only by, you know, Jesus Christ's death on the cross. You know, that's the only thing that can get you saved. And some guy wrote and he said, that uh, it's it's from the one Jack Chick track, and he said, this one is the one that offends me the most. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you know. You know, this guy's writing this thing on a forum that, you know, this one Chick track is the thing that offends him the most. Uh, that's the right reaction of somebody who's lost and on their way to hell and doesn't like to have 
you know, their sins exposed and reproved, you know, you're not going to get along with the world. It's just not going to happen. You say, but I go to a church that's, that's uh, really, we got a lot of lost people coming there. They really enjoy our services. Then you're in a church that's not of God. If you're around Christians that uh, the lost people feel comfortable around, uh, you're with a lot of false prof or false converts, more than likely, false professors of, of faith. But continuing, Second Timothy chapter two, verse fourteen. Okay, it says here, of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. You say, well, see, Brian, that verse condemns you because you're one of these King James only people, and you strive about words. Well, is that true? Yes, I do strive about words. But, notice what it says there. Strive not about words to no profit. Now see, when I strive about words, there is profit to it. Why? Because I strive about the words that the new versions take out of this book or add to this book. And I leave you with a perfect standard. The new version has come along, they take the words out of here, they take the words out of their new versions, they give you no perfect standard. They are the ones that are subverting their hearers, not me. I give you a standard by which you can judge my ministry. Think about that. You get a guy like James White or some of these other liars, and they come out and they give you no standard but their own. I'm a Hebrew and Greek scholar, and the Hebrew word here would be best translated such and such. Well, then how do I judge your ministry? See, there's no perfect standard according to these guys. No perfect God-inspired standard on the planet, other than maybe Greek and Hebrew, which, you know, you can't figure out because you're laity, you know, or some kind of thing. See, they're subverting their hearers. I'm not. You have a problem with me, and you can show me from here that I'm wrong, I'll change. Watch out for that thing of these false prophets that uh, strive about words to no profit. Here we go. Another key scripture coming up. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I'm going to put on a little act here, okay, so don't get worried. But uh, now, what you need to do, this verse here has nothing to do with dispensational teaching. Okay? Because the, the, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation teaches the same thing. Okay? And I have it written out here, so I'm going to read this. All right? Everybody knows that you come to God as a sinner. Okay? And you bring two turtle doves to atone for the sin that the blood of Jesus Christ paid for on the cross. I mean, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And then the Levitical priest, after that, Levitical priest baptizes you seven times in the River Jordan and you stay saved as long as you don't take the mark of the beast or eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or pick up st sticks on the Sabbath day. The Bible teaches the whole, I mean, the, from Genesis to Revelation, it's teaching the same thing. Come on, man, get it into your head. Of course, you have to be vigilant because the devil right now, as a roaring lion, is, is walking about seeking whom he may devour as he is bound in the bottomless pit for the thousand-year millennial kingdom that we are currently in. You say, what? Well, Huh? Well, see, if you're non-dispensational, then that's really what you believe. And of course, the, you know, they'll be, we do not believe that. I do not believe that. I'm non-dispensational, but I believe, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Brethren, all you have to do is just read through the Bible. Read through it one time. You'll see that there are different things going on at different points in time. We call it dispensational teaching, rightly dividing the word of truth. Right? you got to read through it and you got to say, hey, wait a second here, this is no longer for me today. Or this system hasn't come in yet, so that's not for me. That's not heresy. It's called sound biblical understanding. But see, it begins there, 2 Timothy 2.15 starts with study. And if you're a lazy Christian or a novice, you're not going to want to study. You're going to want to just sloppily go through the Bible and try to work everything out and try to, you know, bring it all together. I saw this young uh, kid 
and he was talking about how the Bible is very, uh, it's got, uh, what, inconsistencies in it or something like this. Well, if you're non-dispensational, yeah, it does have a lot of contradictions and a lot of inconsistencies. See, what is that? That young man is a novice. He's a workman that needs to be ashamed. You try to make the whole Bible teach the same thing, you're going to come out with a mess. You can't make the Bible teach the same thing. It teaches different things for different dispensations. Plain and simple. You say, well, I don't like that system. I'm not going to, I refuse to be a dispensationalist. Okay, then you're going to be shipwrecked. It's as simple as that. And the Lord, if you are non-dispensational, and some of the little heretics get all excited when I say this, so get, get ready and cut this part of the video out and put it into your own little video on your stupid little channel and make me look, you know, try to make me look bad. Here we go. Ready? Ready? This is the part where you want to cut it. Okay? If you are non-dispensational, God cannot use you in ministry. Okay, there you cut the other side there. Okay, you got it now? You got that little clip for your, your dumb little video that you're going to put together saying Brian Dunlinger is a heretic? You know, go ahead. Put that out there. Go ahead. Get a little gold star, you know, from the devil. You know, good job. You can't be used in ministry if you're not dispensational. The Bible is never going to make sense to you if you are non-dispensational. Simple. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Interesting. All false doctrine will... All false doctrine, excuse me, will increase unto more ungodliness. Very interesting. You get some guy that starts out and says, you know, I don't know if the pre-trib rapture is correct. All of a sudden, he's going to say, well, then if we're going to go through the tribulation, then we must be Israel. You know, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, no, it's the time of the church's trouble. And we're the ones who are in Judea, you know, there in Matthew chapter 24, and, uh, you know, since we have to endure to the end to be saved, well, then I guess eternal security is not true. And, um, you know, what about people taking the mark of the beast? Yeah, that, they'd lose their salvation. Huh. So maybe then those who truly don't take the mark of the beast, maybe those true martyrs, maybe they're predestinated. Yeah. And then you get into Calvinism. And then you get into, you know, and these guys start out, you know, there with their you know, they're profane and vain babblings, and they increase unto more ungodliness. It starts out going post-trib, and then your replacement theology, and then you believe in works salvation, and then and it goes on and on and on and on and on, and you increase unto more ungodliness. But when you have sound doctrine, it increases to more godliness. You look and you say, yeah, I do believe in the pre-trib rapture. Okay, where does that lead you to? It leads you to saying, Jesus Christ could come back at any time. I better make sure that my life is pure. Purifying hope. See? It makes you more pure. You say, Jesus Christ could come back soon. Boy, I better get, I better get people saved. Better get to witnessing the people. You look at the world and you go, wow, you know, things are really getting bad. But I know Jesus is going to take me out of here before that stuff comes. It increases unto more godliness. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, there goes Paul name and names again, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. You know, it's kind of interesting because saying the resurrection is past already is very much like saying that, you know, Christians are going to have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble and have to endure to the end to be saved. You know, it's a great, you know, I mean, if, if I told you that there, there is no resurrection, kind of like the uh, Sadducees, I think it was, you know, I tell you that there is no resurrection. You say, well, what about my saved uh, grandparents? Oh, sorry. They're dead. They're in the dirt. <laughs> That's kind of a little bit depressing, you know. And if I tell you that you're going to face God's wrath for seven years along with the lost world, that's also very depressing. You know, see. And what's it do? Overthrows the faith of some. 
you get these people that once were, you know, really doing a lot for the Lord and really serving the Lord well and everything. And all of a sudden they now believe that they're going to go through the tribulation. They're going to have to stockpile enough food to survive for seven years without taking the mark of the beast. And they, it messes them up. Their faith is overthrown. I'm telling you, that, that post-trib stuff, <laughs> there aren't many things that are going to mess you up more than that right now. I've seen that thing for years now. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this sealed seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and that every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What is this seal there? You know, Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14 says, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. What's the day of redemption? You say, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Really? Could you please show me a second coming passage? Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21. Show me anywhere in there where there's a resurrection of dead saints. There aren't any. You see, the dead saints that are in Christ right now, the ones that are still sealed under that day of redemption, they come up at the rapture before the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what's going on there. That's the day of redemption. Redemption of the purchased possession. Who's the purchased possession? The body of Christ. What was the price that's paid? The blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? It's right there. You know, it's like you go to a store and you see some, you know, nice thing or something there and you look it and you're like, wow, I'd really like to have that. And you go over and it says sold. And you go, uh, excuse me, sir, could you help me here for a minute? And the guy comes over, yes, what can I do for you? This item here, I'd really like to have that. Sorry, it's sold. It's paid for. We're just waiting for the purchaser to come in and pick it up. Yeah, but I'd really like to have uh, Hey, I'm sorry. Okay? It's sold. It's purchased. That little sold sticker on there is the seal. See? We have a little sold sticker on us. Okay? Spiritually speaking. And... The Lord is the one who purchased us. And the devil can do whatever he wants to do. He can't get you. You have eternal security. You are sealed until the day of redemption. So what about the verse in Hebrews? Okay, yeah, yeah, go, go on. Go find some verses in the Old Testament. Just go all over the Bible and find verses that prove that you can lose your salvation. You know, go ahead, do that. Little non-dispensational heretic you, you know. <laughs> I get tired of these people. But you know, the point is, we are sealed until the day of redemption. It's a promise. I'm not worried about losing my salvation. Losing rewards? Yeah, I can do that. Losing my testimony, losing my joy, losing my health, losing things? Yeah, I can do all that stuff. But I can't lose my salvation. It's not mine to lose. I'm a purchased possession. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and 21 Go back there. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. What's the gold and silver there? There are vessels of gold and silver, and also wood and earth. Well, the gold is righteousness. The silver, if you look at Psalm 12, 6, and 7, it talks about the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You know? So, let me ask you a question. Do you have God's righteousness in your life? You say yes. Then you're a gold vessel. Has anybody ever said about you that you're a walking Bible? Do you know the word of God well? Do you Are you able to quote scripture? Well, then you're a silver vessel. 
if you know the Bible well and you're quoting a lot of scripture and things like that, you're going to bring glory to the Lord. And He can use you. The Lord can put you into situations because He knows what's going to come out of your mouth is His Word. Not your feelings, not your opinions, not your preferences. You're going to be a silver vessel. How about wood? What is wood? Well, you are to be a fruit-bearing tree. But what, are, what if you're like the uh, fig tree there in Matthew chapter 21, verses 19 through 20, where Jesus comes to the fig tree and he finds nothing but leaves on it. And he rebukes it because it's not producing any fruit. Is that how you are as a Christian? Are you a tree that produces no fruit? You should produce fruit. How about earth? What is earth? Well, our flesh is made of the dust of the ground. Are you a fleshly Christian? Well, according to the verse there, those verses we just read, gold and silver vessels are to honor the Lord. They bring honor to the Lord and to His Word. Wood and earth, earthen vessels, bring dishonor to the Lord. So the Lord looks down at a Christian, and that Christian's got their own thing, they got their career, they got their whole agenda in life, and the Lord just looks down and says, earthen vessel. And he looks over and he sees this other Christian, and they're just messing around with the lusts of the flesh. They watch TV, and they just, you know, just fleshly, carnal. And once he looked down, he says, that's an earthen vessel. And they dishonor the Lord. You should strive to be a gold and silver vessel. Okay, and the Bible notice it says there about the, if a man purge himself from these, the quality of the vessel is up to you. That's not God's job. God can convict you, yeah, sure. But your job, brother, sister, is to purge yourself from things that make you an, a wooden or an earthen vessel. You should strive to be a gold or a silver vessel. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Okay? Notice it doesn't say to dabble with youthful lusts and try it out so you can really kind of, you know, just see how it is. Uh-uh. It says flee youthful lusts. Is there anywhere else in the Bible that talks about fleeing something? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 10 and 11 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Very similar there to what we just read in uh, verse 22. You are to flee youthful lusts. You are to flee covetousness. The love of money there. Flee from it. Don't mess with it. Verse 23, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 through 26. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, if you get into any kind of soul-winning ministry, one of the favorite things that a lost person will do is they will try to take you off, get you off course. They'll start asking you questions about contradictions in the Bible or, or uh, people that have never heard the gospel, did they go to hell? Um, or evolution, or whatever. They'll try to take you away from you pointing out the fact that they're a sinner. you got to keep it focused. When you're witnessing to people, and they start to try and do that, you avoid those foolish and unlearned questions. You know, and, you know, you get some, some idiot in there like, you know, uh, you know, I've been drinking beer for all my life, you know, or something, or for five years now, and God hasn't dropped me dead yet. What do you have to say about that? Uh, you know, and you say, well, are you a sinner? You know, if I take you through the Ten Commandments, can you come out of that saying that you've never once committed a sin? 
yeah, well, what about this guy down at my work that's a Christian, he's a hypocrite? No, 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 we're not talking about that guy. What about you? What about you? I'm trying to explain to you here the way of salvation. You know, avoid their foolish and unlearned questions. And you say, well, if the guy starts to get arrogant with me, then I should just start screaming at him and, you know, yell at him and things like that. No, you shouldn't do that. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. You know, uh, we read about that there, I think it was the last study, about how that the Jews were opposing themselves when they blasphemed the name of the Lord. When somebody says, don't talk to me about that gospel stuff, about that salvation, I don't want to hear about that, what they're doing is they're opposing themselves. Uh, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus Christ. And that's the dumbest thing that they can do. But at that point you have to actually remember, hey, this is a lost soul on their way to hell, and you be gentle towards them. That's not always easy. There are times that you just want to, you know, pound somebody. You can't do that though. And you're trying to help them to acknowledge the truth there so that they can recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. That's what you're trying to do. So that's going to be it for this study. That's one of my favorite chapters in the New Testament. A lot of good stuff in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um, I can tell you right now, uh, just, to, just to reiterate what I said earlier, you have to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. If you aren't rightly dividing the word of truth, you're going to make a mess of the Bible. Um, I've said it before, anybody who teaches a post-trib uh, rapture of the body of Christ, they, every single one without fail has to cross dispensational lines. Every single time. You cannot prove from the Pauline epistles, exclusively from the Pauline epistles, that Christians go through the time of Jacob's trouble. You can't prove it. You say, well, what's the big deal there? The Pauline epistles are written to you as a Christian. Now, the rest is there for instruction in righteousness, and there are other books, of course, where you can get some doctrine from. I'm not saying you don't get any doctrine from the Gospels. I'm not saying that. I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. Um, but the thing is, Paul is the... Um, apostle to the Gentiles. And so most of the instructions for us today come from the Pauline epistles. And as I said, and that's a challenge to any post-tribber out there that's watching this thing, if you made it this far, um, prove a post-trib rapture exclusively from the Pauline epistles. Show me it. Can't do it. And see, I'm rightly dividing the word of truth through study. Of scripture. But these people who don't rightly divide the word of truth and go to Matthew 24 as their favorite place to go, they're making a mess of the Bible. They are a workman that needs to be ashamed. And they're going to bring shame on you if you're dumb enough to listen to them. So we will close here with a word of prayer. And uh, I pray that you will really take heed to the things that uh, were said in this study. Uh, like I said, there's some really important things here. But let's close with a word of, word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that, that uh, we are not left without witness, that we can know what your plans are for us. Lord, I pray that the people out there would consider themselves to be soldiers and that they would remember that we are at war and they can't take it easy down here and just uh, think that everything's going to work out okay and that Satan is not really the God of this world right now. Um, I pray, Lord, that they would remember that there are some very, very evil times out there and it's just going to get worse as time goes by. I pray that you would strengthen your children, Lord, uh, help them to have um, really just courage for the times that are ahead. I don't know what we have to go through, Lord, before you take us out of here, but I just pray that you would please... Um, Help them to stay true to your word. Help them to study, Lord, and to learn to rightly divide the word of truth so that they don't get messed up doctrinally. And um, I guess I just pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That will be it for 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll see you next week with chapter 3. Thank you very much for watching.